Thanks. So um, I'll be talking about some other work that we're doing in, in Salinas. Same community, different project. Uh, this is the Hermosa study, and this is a community university collaborative that's funded by the California Breast Cancer Research Program. And one of the stipulations of this grant is that it has two PIs, that we have two equal PIs. One is a uh, university PI, and the other is a member of the community. So I am the research PI, and Kimberly Para um, is my community partner down in Salinas. Um, Hermosa, by the way, means beautiful in Spanish. Um, we really like our acronyms in our research group. Um, it means beautiful in Spanish, and that reflects the uh, study population. We're talking about Latina girls and their makeup use. Uh, so this study was concerned about um, potential endocrine disrupting chemicals in personal care products. And specifically, we were interested in four um, chemical classes. Uh, the first class are phthalates, which are found in fragrance in personal care products. Um, they're also found in rubber products, or I'm sorry, uh, plastic products like the rubber duck up there. Um, but we weren't interested in that particular kind of phthalate. We were interested in the ones that are in personal care products. Um, parabens are preservative, used in makeup and other personal care products to prevent growth of mold. Um, triclosan is an antibacterial agent. It's found in some toothpaste and in your liquid soap that says antibacterial on it. Uh, and oxybenzone is a sunscreen agent. We were concerned about these chemicals because there's evidence um, of endocrine disrupting action. Uh, phthalates are, uh, show anti-androgenic action. Parabens and oxybenzone are, uh, appear to be weak estrogen mimics. Uh, and triclosan seems to um, affect thyroid hormone levels. The aims of this study were, first of all, to characterize levels and sources of exposure to these endocrine disruptors um, from personal care products in young Latino women. Uh, and then, more importantly, to see if we could actually lower the levels of these chemicals in their bodies. But we also had two other aims. One was to empower local youth in scientific research methods, and the other was to work with local youth on health education and advocacy uh, skills. So I'll talk about the, the aims two and three in a minute, but let's start with the main one and two, the main part of our study. Um, what we did in this study is we enrolled 100 teenage girls living in Salinas. And they came in for their first visit, their pre-intervention visit, and we got detailed information on all of the personal care products and makeup they'd used in the last 48 hours or so. And we took a urine sample from them um, so that we could measure levels of these chemicals in their urine. And then we talked to them about endocrine disruptors in their personal care products, which none of them had any idea about. Um, and what we asked them to do is not use any of their regular cosmetics or personal care products for three days. And we gave them some low chemical alternatives to use. And then after three days, they came back. They gave us another urine sample. And we measured it to see if the levels of these chemicals went down in their bodies. Um, so here's just a schematic to show they came in. No using your regular stuff. No nail polish, no perfume. And then come back to follow up. This was their favorite part of our study. They, at their first visit, they got to go to our beauty bar, um, and everybody got uh, small containers of a whole bunch of things that they would really need for the next three days. So everybody got shampoo, conditioner, soap. Uh, we gave them a little uh, container of liquid hand soap to carry in their purse so that they didn't have to, they could even use soap when they were, our, our products when they were out of the house. Um, and then they got to choose four cosmetic products that they couldn't live without for three days. So this included you know, foundation, eye makeup, uh, lip, lipstick, lip gloss. Uh, for people who use sunscreen, they got an alternate sunscreen. Also, people that used toothpaste that had triclosan in it were given an alternate toothpaste to use. They went home with a little makeup bag of all this stuff. Um, so just to give you a little idea of what we considered our low chemical alternatives or how we came up with them, um, we basically just identified them through shopping trips, looking on the internet, things like the Environmental Working Group's um, Skin Deep database to just get some ideas of some brands. And then we spent a lot of time looking at ingredients lists. So parabens, triclosan, and oxybenzone, which is also BP3, are, are all listed on the ingredient list. So all of the products we, we chose uh, had to be free of these ingredients. Phthalates are a little bit harder because they're not necessarily listed on the ingredient list. Phthalates are used in fragrance. Fragrance is proprietary. So uh, we looked for either brands that said, or products that said that they didn't have parfum or fragrance in them that were fragrance free, or if they were scented products, they had to specifically say on the bottle that there were no phthalates used in their fragrance. 
Um, and we also really wanted to prioritize products that were available that girls could use uh, after the study was over. So we tried to find things that were available in local retailers and that weren't too expensive, which is a problem when you're looking at low chemical products. Um, I do want to stress, we didn't actually do any chemical tests. We didn't take the replacement products and measure them in the lab to make sure they didn't have these chemicals in them for two reasons. One, it was prohibitively expensive. The other is we wanted to do a study that could be replicated by consumers. We wanted to have the same information that a consumer has choosing products off the shelf. So now I want to give you a little bit more context. Brenda always mentioned this, but this study took place in Salinas where a lot of our research group's work takes place. And um, You'll remember I mentioned that the, the last two aims of this study were to really empower youth in research methods and public health advocacy and education. Um, to give you the context of this community, Brenda already mentioned, but there's a high youth homicide rate, a lot of gang violence, gang um, involvement. And when you talk about the girls, too, there's a lot of attention in Salinas about the problems of the boys and violence. The girls have plenty of problems, too. For example, we have one of the, the uh, highest teen birth rates in California. Um, and a lot of school, kids dropping out of school, girls dropping out of school. And also, this is a community that has very few opportunities for youth. They don't, are not, any, not good opportunities for summer jobs, not good opportunities for science or math or, or uh, that kind of uh, uh, STEM education. So we really wanted to do a study within a study. On one hand, we're looking at our, our study about uh, lowering chemical levels. On the other hand, we also wanted to work with a group of youth and see what difference we could make in their lives. So this is our youth council. We've been working with them for, I think, seven years now um, on a bunch of different projects. So these are youth leaders um, from the local high school that we have been working with, meet with them twice, uh, twice a month to just talk about environmental health, environmental literacy in their community, um, and doing different projects with them. So the Hermosa study was the biggest project we've done with them. Actually, all of these students have graduated and moved on now. Um, we have a new group of youth that we've just enrolled. Uh, many of these youth actually are now attending uh, UCs or Cal State, and they're all the first generation in their families to go to college. So here are some of the things we did with the youth. Um, we, in one of our meetings, we talked to them about endocrine disruptors in, in personal care products, which was something they didn't, knew nothing about. They were really sort of shocked to learn about this and, and upset because they said, well, teens use a lot of these products and we had no idea, you know, and we're undergoing reproductive development. Um, so this was something they were interested in. Um, and so we worked with them to design the study, um, devise the name and logo. So they, this is them voting on, on what the name should be and the logo should be. Um, we really wanted to involve them in all aspects of the study design and make sure they had ownership of this project. They tested out all of our different alternate products, chose which ones they thought would be more appropriate for teens, which the teens would like, which they wouldn't like. Um, and then we hired them as UC Berkeley re research assistants for the summer to actually do our data collection. So uh, they did all the interviews, they, co they did all the recruiting, they recruited 100 teens, teen girls through word of mouth, through social media, through texting, um, collected the urine samples. Uh, and then at the end of the summer, we took them up to the uh, biomonitoring lab up at the California Department of Public Health uh, to, see, to meet the chemists and learn how you actually do this kind of biomonitoring. So here's some of the results that we found. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, there are the girls that we enrolled, the 100 girls, uh, ranged in age from 14 to 18. They were all Mexican or Mexican-American, not because that was one of our re enrollment requirements, but because that's the community we're in. Um, and m more than half of them were living below the poverty line, according to, we got this information from their parents. Uh, these are the levels of the different chemicals in their urine at the baseline visit, and you can see that more than 90% of all the girls, as we also see in NHANES, um, you know, were all exposed to these chemicals. More than 90% of the girls had detectable levels of, of triclosan, BP3, uh, parabens, and phthalates, the phthalates that we were interested in. And then we looked to see how their levels in their urine was correlated with the products that they've been using in the last two days. Um, here you can see uh, Colgate Total is uh, the main toothpaste. I believe it's the only toothpaste that contains triclosan. And you can see that uh, girls who used Colgate Total had significantly uh, higher levels of triclosan in their urine. Um, we also found associations with hand soap. So at that baseline visit, if they had used liquid hand soap in the last two days, they had significantly higher levels of triclosan in their urine. If they'd used bar soap instead, their levels were lower, although that wasn't statistically significant. Um, 
strangely, when we asked them specifically about antibacterial soap, we didn't see a difference. But I think this may be because people just don't really know what kind of soap they're using. So BP3 is a sunscreen agent. It's also known as oxybenzone. Um, we found that girls who'd used uh, sunscreen in the last two days had significantly higher levels of, of oxybenzone or BP3 in their urine. Um, we also looked at foundation and lip balm because sometimes these have sun protectant factor in them, but we didn't see associations with those. Um, in terms of phthalates, I'll show you the results for, um, for MEP, which is one of the main phthalates that we're exposed to and is in fragrances. We were really surprised we didn't find any difference um, among girls who had worn perfume or fragrance or products with fragrance in them in the last few days, although almost everybody was wearing products with fragrance in them, so that may be part of the problem. However, we did see that girls who were reported solid deodorant in the last uh, two days had higher levels, and girls who reported using lotion or moisturizer had higher levels of, of um, MEP. Um, moving on to parabens, uh, girls who wore makeup every day had significantly higher levels of parabens in their bodies. And specifically, this seemed to be driven by foundation, blush, and mascara. Those were the three types of makeup that were, were significantly associated with higher levels in their bodies. So these were all the baseline uh, findings. But the real question we wanted to know is, did their levels actually go down when we asked them to change products? And here's what we found. Um, triclosan levels, oops, sorry. Uh, triclosan levels went down, uh, sorry, I'm trying to remember, 36%, I thought it was on there, um, went down about 36% of just over just three days of changing their products. Uh, BP3 also went down about 35% over three days of changing the products that they used. Um, here you can see phthalates. Uh, MEP went down 25%. Um, we didn't see statistically significant decreases in the other two phthalates that are commonly found in, in uh, primary care products or personal care products. Uh, and the last one, parabens, we found 40, about 44, 45% decrease in the two main parabens that are used in personal care products. Those are methylparaben and propylparaben. Um, interestingly, uh, you can see that those two minor parabens, the uh, butylparaben and the ethylparaben, that aren't used nearly as much, uh, did actually go up. Uh, and butylparaben increases statistically significantly. So we don't know why this is, although we suspect that maybe, or we hypothesize that maybe there were regrettable substitutions in some of the low chemical products that we'd chosen. They, none of them, they all had, did not have parabens on their ingredient list, and yet somehow people's levels went up. I don't know if it was a contamination um, or what was behind this, but, but this is what we found. We did find an increase. The levels were very low, and they were still very low, but they almost doubled. Oh, there we go. Um, just to give you a comparison, there are other phthalates and, uh, and phenols. We measured bis, uh, bisphenol A and a bunch of other phthalates because that was just part of the analytical run that we did. We didn't expect these to change over the course of inter the intervention because they're not primarily found in personal care products. And you can see here that those other chemicals did not change. When the only thing we changed was personal care product use, so we didn't expect a change in these. We also asked the participants about their attitudes about being in the study. Um, and 86% said they learned something new about chemicals and cosmetics. 30% of them said that after that first visit, they went home and looked at the ingredient list of their products that they'd been using. Um, and 93% said that they would like to or they would try to buy uh, beauty products without endocrine disruptors in them. I don't know how realistic or sustainable it is, but at least they had a desire. Uh, one of the other things that we did is we felt like it was important to let the study participants uh, know what we had found. So we held a community forum that was run by our research, our youth research assistants to return the results to the community, to the participants as a whole, and then the girls had the option of learning their individual results. Um, and here you can see an example of the packet that we used to hand back results. We also worked with the youth to have, have them develop advocacy and outreach activities that were really initiated by them and driven by them by our youth research assistants. Um, one of the things they loved was the, the do-it-yourself recipes they found on the internet. They made a lot of recipe cards, handed them out of health fairs. Um, they did a change.org petition. They actually came to Sacramento and spoke to um, 
policymakers, and they also spoke to the Safer Consumer Products Commission right upstairs. Um, and they also had a social media presence. Uh, so in summary, what we found was we were able to identify products that were the highest contributors to endocrine disruptor exposure in these teenage girls. Um, and we were able to reduce the concentrations in their urine by 25 to 45 percent um, by switching products for just three days. Um, and the take-home message we felt was that low, product, low chemical products help. They seem to be making a difference. Um, and then another really important result of this study was that we were able to empower youth by training them to be scientific researchers, health educators, and advocates. Um, and this was something just, uh, we, we have a paper in review that's uh, in the Health Education Journal just talking about what the youth said, the youth, researchers assist, uh, youth research assistants said about their experience and learning that science is something that's accessible or something that's relevant or can have a difference in your community. Um, and we're really proud of them, so many of them going on to college, 12 of the 15 are now in college. Many of them are saying they want to major in public health or environmental sciences. Uh, so that part has been really rewarding too. Uh, so here's just another picture of some of our youth uh, research associates and um, all of our collaborators, uh, including the California Department of Public Health Biomonitoring Lab, which did all of our measurements. And we were funded, as I mentioned, by the Breast Cancer Research Program. Thank you.